This is Bible Academy. We are continuing our study in the book of Daniel. But before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our sins according to 1 John 1 9, that we are controlled by the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege and the opportunity to study your word. We ask that as we look into these details of not only the life of Daniel, but of history and how your sovereignty has worked, that we will have open hearts and minds to learn the principles and truths that you have recorded for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pick up the story after Daniel is thrown into the lion's den overnight. Daniel chapter 6 verse 19. Then the king arose at dawn at earliest daylight and went in haste to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an, an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you constantly serve, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel spoke to the king, O king, live forever! My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouth of the lions. They have not harmed me. Because I was found innocent before him, all sword toward you, O king, I have done no crime. Before we move on to the next verse, I wanted to point out a few things here that I did not get to in our last lesson. We see Daniel say, My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. Now, the nature of the lion has not been changed. Some seem to think that this is like the millennium where animals will be tame and the lion will lie down with the lamb. That's not what's happened. Here we're told that was not the case. An angel came in and shut the mouths of the lions. How we did it exactly we're not told except that an angel is involved, and he did keep the mouths of the lions closed, the way Daniel put it, indicating that a angel, an angel, was protecting Daniel. Remember that Daniel was some 83 years old, appearing to be totally defenseless, he was tossed into this den of lions, except that the Lord was not going to allow him to be touched by a lion. God's sovereignty in action. When it's not our time to go, it's not our time to go. Daniel says, They have not harmed me, the pa el perfect, of the word kavel. I wanted to show you this word. You'll see the reason in a moment. It's kavel. It means to harm or damage or destroy. This is the same word we have at the end of the verse for what I translated as crime. When he says, I haven't committed a crime against the king. This is the noun form. The word at the end of the verse is, excuse me, this is the verb form here. At the end of the verse, it's the noun. Now, anything that was done against the king, let me put that back up there. Also toward you, O king, I have done no crime. 
Now we are to understand that anything done towards the king to harm him would be a capital offense. It would be a capital crime. But I wanted us to keep this sense of the word that Daniel is saying he was not out to hurt the king in any way. If you think of it, all he did was pray to his God. That wouldn't hurt the king. And he didn't want the king to think that he had tried to hurt him. He was simply worshiping his God. A good, objective way to put it. So Daniel does not see himself as doing anything wrong against the king though most everyone else would consider that the case. He didn't jump on the bandwagon, so to speak, to uh, worship the king and only the king for one month. The other thing that Daniel does here is to take the fact that the lions did not hurt him as proof that he was not guilty. At least from the divine viewpoint, from the standpoint of what God does in people's lives, he intervened supernaturally to make sure that this lion didn't kill Daniel. So it should seem clear to the king that Daniel was praying at the time to the one true God and that was the right thing to do and for the king to try and punish him for that was wrong. So the king was to learn a lesson too and he did. We see in verse 23 that that didn't really bother the king what Daniel had said. He was glad to see that Daniel was delivered. In verse 23 we see his reaction. Then the king was very pleased and gave orders for Daniel to be taken out, taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Well, the king was very pleased. He got his top man back. Uh, he could now deal with the conspirators. Those people who had set Daniel up and manipulated the king. He was relieved that though he was tricked, it had still worked out so that Daniel was not harmed. It might be that Daniel probably slept better that night than the king, even though Daniel was in the lion's den. Apparently he had seen the angel at work, and that's why he comments that the angel shut the mouths of the lions. Daniel knew he was safe and sound. Not many people can say they spent the night with a den of lions with an angel protecting them. Then the final and big compliment about Daniel, the most important one, there was no injury to Daniel because he had trusted his God. The word for trusted, it sounds similar to what we hear even in our churches today. Amen. It's the Hafel causative stem. He trusted, he believed, he was convinced about God. Like his three friends, their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they totally relied on God. Either God would deliver them or he would not. Either way, they put the situation in God's hands. Now that's trust. That is an act of faith. The king saw that kind of faith in Daniel. 
I expect Daniel prayed all the way up to the time he was released down into the den. The same time trusting that God's will be done. And in this case, God responded by sending an angel to close the mouth of, to close the mouth of the lions. It was not yet time for Daniel to die, and especially not this way. God had more for him to do. In Hebrews chapter eleven, we have the roster of the heroes of faith. This passage has several key points on the principle of faith, of pleasing God, and reward. Let's go look at some of it. Hebrews chapter 11. We'll look at the first couple of verses first. Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 1. We'll do 1 and 2 together. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now this is a simple and yet profound definition of faith. The word for assurance is the idea of complete confidence. In other words, you know. You know right now as a Christian that there's a God. It's even ridiculous to debate it. You're absolutely sure of it. God is very real in your life. You also know that Jesus Christ died in your place on the cross. Now, you didn't see that. You don't see God. <clears throat> Yet, you believe Him. You are convinced. You are more than that. You're convicted of those facts. Verse 2. And by it, faith... Men of old receive commendation. So by faith, what we just defined, convinced of something not seen, the assurance of things hoped for, by it men of old receive commendation. The word commendation, the aorist, passive, indicative, martyreo, that might surprise you. Martyreo is the word we usually use for bear witness or even the word to martyr. It has the idea of uh, men were uh, proven by their witness. Therefore, they are commended. Notice it's in a passive voice. By faith, men prove themselves. I often think of a soldier. He proves his bravery in battle. And he's sometimes commended for it. If it's above and beyond, he gets a medal or some sort of recognition. But by faith, we as believers are commended. We prove ourselves. We bear witness to the fact of what we believe. Verse 6. A very interesting verse. Let's jump to verse 6. Now, without faith, it is impossible to please God. The word God is implied here. For he who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder 
to those who seek him. I think most of us don't have a problem understanding the first phrase, now without faith it is impossible to please God. But the next two raise some questions. Let's look at these points. First of all, it's impossible to please God without faith. We should always be trusting God. I don't care whether you're walking down the street driving down the freeway or doing something very unusual standing for your faith in a difficult situation. We should be trusting God and what we're doing, what we're going to do. That's a lot easier said than done because the world has pretty much, pretty much blinded many people to trusting God. We've been trained in school, in business, and many other fields to trust in our own abilities. But one must do that, that with the important qualifier that he is also trusting in God. God gave you that ability. You see, we should have learned that from our earlier lesson about the fact that one can't do anything without God giving him breath. The point is made that it's impossible to please God without faith. You can't please God unless you live a life of faith. Notice, it's not a life of works. It's a life of faith. We'll put that in perspective in a moment. But nothing short of faith will please God. And we as Christians often fail to realize that the Christian's life is about faith. Trusting God in all our ways. The world preaches the opposite. Do it yourself. It's up to you. You can do it. But at the core of the Christian faith is trusting God. Now, second point. The next phrase, in fact, for he who comes to God. I don't particularly care for this translation. It might be better translated for he who draws near to God. The reason is, this is the concept that you basically want to know God. And it's expressed in your coming to Him. You humble yourself before him to do his will. This is the same word behind, uh, well, it's in uh, Hebrews 4.16, therefore let us draw near. Same word. And that verse, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. So we're talking about a humble, a submissive attitude when it says, he who comes to God. Now, once you come to God, you come to the point where you decide that you're going to, in your heart, desire to know him. Let me use the board a little bit here. Let me do it this way. One, you draw near. Once you decide to draw near to God, the next step is believing. They come pretty close together here. You must believe. And there's two things mentioned here you must believe. One, that God exists. Now you say, well, that's obvious. Yes, it is obvious. If you don't believe that God exists, you don't have anybody to believe in. Secondly,
that he is rewarder to those who seek him. Now this is where we get hung up. How many times have you been in a church where the pastor will say, let's get to work for God's reward? I would dare say that that never happens. And yet it is an important principle as a motivational principle for a Christian. It's right here. You must believe that God exists, and you must believe that his, he is a rewarder. Now, some of you are probably saying, what are you talking about? Well, let's just put this a little different angle here. When you were saved, did you receive a reward? You acted in faith. You trusted in Christ. You were given eternal life. That's quite a reward. You received a basic inheritance pass package, something we've, we've studied in other passages. Not only is the basic inheritance package come with being an adopted adult son of God, but there are rewards for service. We've also studied that there are special crowns. One of the main reasons that we serve God is that there is great reward in it. It's fundamental to the law. You obey, you're blessed. That was drilled in the people. That was drilled into the people for, for a thousand plus years. Before that, they believed God's promise. And for that, there was the reward of righteousness the reward of the fulfillment of the promise with blessing. They received the land. If they were obedient, they were blessed in the land. That's a form of reward. One of the things we need to realize, basically, that we believe God and we believe that He rewards those who seek Him. Now that is key, to seek God. I will just throw this in. If you do not love the Word of God, you're not seeking God. Because those who seek God seek His truth. Here's how this works. You serve God. You work for God. While you live by faith. That equals reward. This all comes by seeking God. Unfortunately, there are many people who have become Christians that quit seeking God. They sought Him in a desperate time for salvation, and they were given salvation as a reward. Then the seeking drops off. Why? because they choose not to seek. Now, we just saw in the previous verse the issue of faith. Without faith, you can't please God. Without seeking Him, you can't serve Him and live by faith 
and receive reward. It all ties in. That's all necessary to please God. Do we really serve God because we just love Him? Certainly we're supposed to love Him. But God has given us a natural, creaturely instinct that we want pleasure in life also. You say, well, we're not supposed to be seeking pleasure. God does. We just saw that. It pleases Him when you use your faith. God gave us the sense of pleasure and reward as a way in which we are pleased. I'll just turn that over the other way. Uh, do we do things knowing that we don't get anything out of it? God wants us to be pleased also. That's why he gives us reward. Rewards that fill in and also overwhelm us. So that we are more pleased. Nothing wrong with being pleased. Now, let me just ask you a question. Do you think Daniel pleased God? Of course. Let's jump down to verses 32 and 33. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, there's David, administered justice, there's your judges, Gained what was promised. There's people like Abraham who shut the mouths of lions. There's our Daniel. Well, now that Daniel's out of the den, and rightly so, the king still had some business to do in setting things straight. Verse 24. The king then gave orders, and they brought those men who had maliciously accused Daniel, and they cast them, their children and their wives, into the lion's den. And they had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. I can imagine that this is a movie, this is the scene that would turn dark at the end as the families have walked over to the den and tossed in one after the other. The screen goes dark and you hear crunch, crunch. Well, the king did not like what these men had done to Daniel or himself. They had maliciously accused Daniel. They had made Daniel look like he opposed the king. And in fact, he was one of the most loyal supporters and servants of the king. They had duped the king, made him look like a fool, manipulated him. Now we're not told how many of these men with their families are tossed into the den. Perhaps the king only had the leaders executed with their families, that's probably the case. It's unlikely that he had had dozens of families lined up for the den of lions. Now this word for maliciously accused back in verse 24. He bought these men who had maliciously accused Daniel. 
It literally means to eat the pieces of. They devoured Daniel with their malicious tongue, and now they are about to be devoured by the lions. The ancient historian tells us that according to the laws in those days, the entire family was executed in these type of situations. The point is made that before they can even reach the bottom of the floor of the cave or the den, the lions grabbed them in the air and crushed even their bones. This is a horrible and terrifying death. It sounds like it's fairly instant. And now we see that there was nothing wrong with these lions. They could have attacked Daniel at any time and eaten Daniel any time. But God did not let that happen. Well, now it's really feeding time. They have the right food. And justice is done. Well, with this out of the way, King Darius was ready to do something similar to what Grandfather Nebuchadnezzar had done. He makes a proclamation to the people about the God of Daniel. Then Darius the king wrote to all the peoples, nations and men of every language who are living in all the land. He begins by writing, May your peace increase. So Darius has written this proclamation. It says it goes out to everyone, all people, nations, and every language in all the land or earth. As kings often did, they acted as though the whole world was listening. Though this message most likely went through official channels and reached some of the people around key cities where this message would be repeated, proclaimed, within the realm. And don't lose sight of the fact that Cyrus is still king of the much larger Persian Empire. But he must have got the word also. But also don't forget that Cyrus had been moved by God to show favor towards the Jewish people and sending them or allowing them back to the land. The king says in typical fashion, may your peace increase or bound. Verse 26. From me a decree is established in all the dominion of my kingdom, People are to revere and fear the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His authority is forever. He rescues and delivers and performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of lions. Now here we see the basis of this decree, the fact that he brings out the uh, fact that Daniel was rescued from the power of lions. Now, in the ancient world, the lions was a terrible, terribly feared animal. Very strong. Uh, fierce. Fearsome. First, the proclamation tells them what they should do. People are told to revere and fear the God of Daniel. Now, you just can't order people to do that, but at least the king was on the right track. Something I wish our next president would be. If he's not a God-fearer, we are already in trouble. 
there is every reason to fear or tremble if you're not in good standing with God as Darius is proclaiming. He was telling those in his dominion that as people we must fear the God of Daniel. He gives several reasons why. Now understand that fear also means revere. I think that's a deeper word than just respect. It's a deep honor. There's a deep, a deeper respect to the point of reverence. The king gives a list in his proclamation. First of all, he is living. He's a living God that endures forever. He never ends. So he recognized, at least to some point, the inner, uh, the uh, the eternality of God. Also, his kingdom will never be destroyed. He has an everlasting kingdom, which puts his own kingdom in perspective. His is someday end. That this God of Daniel, his kingdom, will never end. He says his authority is forever. His authority is forever. Recognizes the sovereignty of God. He rescues and delivers as he sees with Daniel, a good example. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. And this was certainly a wonder that Daniel was delivered from the power of lions. And now I expect those stories that he had heard about the fiery furnace, the writings on the wall, and so on, became a reality to him. These truths put a earthly king in his place. No comparison between an earthly king and the God of Daniel. And if you think of it, what king would not want God's blessing upon him and upon his realm? Well, as this story hits the news wires and the Jews get back to the land and hear about this, it must have been refreshing to their faith to know that God was still active among his people. It's good to hear about old Daniel again, that he was still alive and kicking and stirring up a little trouble in the kingdom, active in his faith towards God. Another miracle had occurred. God is still there for them, for his people, as he is allowing them back into the land to rebuild. So you might say Daniel was watching over them from that end. That end of the kingdom. Verse 28 closes the story. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. There we see Cyrus mentioned, uh, the king of the Persian Empire. So Daniel went on to prosper. Now before we move on to chapter 7, I want us to learn some important lessons we see here. We've had some great lessons from God's Word. I want to talk about the Christian, his faith, and pressure. As we grow in our faith, we will often come under many kinds of pressure. Not just the normal ones of life. Now and then we drive downtown Houston. That's pressure. 
especially as you get older and your, act, your actions slow down. It's not something you look forward to. Now, when you're younger, you take it as a challenge. Let's go. But pressure can come in different ways, sometimes several at one time. Sometimes a few, but very intense. And then there's the added factor of Satan and his cosmic system coming down on us. And clearly that was something that was going on with Daniel. These men who went after him, motivated by evil, with evil motives. But let's learn some things from the test of faith with that both Daniel and then what his friends went through. Let's do some comparisons and look at some things that were different with these tests of faith. Remember that at the beginning of the book, they were all tested in their youth, having just come out of a war as captives, brought hundreds of miles, and placed in a foreign country. Of course, Daniel and our three friends, well, they were put into the academy to learn the ways of Babylon. And before you know it, they're facing their first test as young teenagers with the king's food. And then we see the young men, the young friends, tested again with the fiery furnace, refusing to bow down to the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had made. We see that God often puts us with other Christians to share with each other's strength, to pray together, to encourage one another, to push us forward in our faith. That's invaluable. To have friends that pray with you when you struggle, when you face these pressures. Late in life, Daniel faced his test alone. As an old man, Daniel had to deal with some of the most powerful men in the kingdom. Many of them planned and plotted against him, winning the king over, and Daniel found himself helpless as far as getting help from the king or the king doing the right thing and Daniel was alone except of course that he trusted God now listen that is exactly the way that God had planned it for Daniel he was to learn to trust God as an old man to put his faith in the sovereignty of God and that God would work out his will in his life. Daniel may have been set aside as an administrator, as an official, but he didn't retire from being a believer. If anything, he is challenged at this point in his life that we might call a high point in his life. Unlike what the world says, like, you know, he was past his prime. He's not going to accomplish much. He can't accomplish much. Much. Daniel was in his prime. Because you see, it's about faith. 
he was the strongest in his faith and would be the greatest example as he would go down in the record books, well, in the faith of the Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11, the Faith Hall of Fame. Well, let these things be a lesson to the young and to the old. God will test you when you've only been a believer a short time. God will test you even when you only have a short time left on this earth. And one final observation before we move on to our next chapter. That has to do with the tests themselves. God had both Daniel and his friends face death. death from the state authorities in these cases. God let these men go into the fiery furnace and Daniel into the lion's den alone. They were there in a hopeless and helpless situation. No way out. One or two things are going to happen. Either God is going to let me be killed which was fine with them. Or there was going to be a miraculous deliverance. Now we've seen this before, but don't forget it. God delivered them through these things, not from them. Uh, let's remember that. I have to remember that myself. These are... At, I consider these advanced tests in the Christian life to be delivered through the great test, not from them. There are times when God will allow us to go into hopeless and helpless situations, not of our own doing. We're just there doing what we do as believers. And that will become a test of our faith. There are times when God will allow the godless, the mean-spirited, to have their way with us up to a point. We are to trust. We are to believe we are to exercise faith, stand still, and watch the deliverance of the Lord. God is sovereign. Let's pray. Father, what a marvelous lesson you've given us in the life of Daniel and watching how you delivered him through this test. And Lord, you have these things recorded for a reason, for us to learn, for us to understand that if we are to please you, we are to live by faith. Now, Lord, I don't think many of us want to invite these kinds of tests. But we do ask that when you bring them onto us that we will be ready and that we will be strong in our faith. It will be to your glory. And we know that you are a rewarder to those of us who live by faith. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name.